6, 115, let me just read one more. The word of thy Lord doth find its fulfillment in truth and in justice. None can change his word, Moses says. Did you get that? None can change his word. For he is the one who heareth and knoweth all. And what he's saying here is he's saying that God's word is infallible. It cannot be changed because he knows. And he's the one you better fear. In other words, he's saying that God watches over his word to perform it. Now, we're not going to say it his way. We're going to say it the way our Bible says it. Our Bible says God watches over his word to perform it. You see? But that's what he's saying right here to make sure that it stays pure, it stays holy. So we turn to the Muslim and go, what about this? You know. Now, I know they're going to, in their natural mind, always want to come back and say, yes, yes, I know what you're saying, but you're not interpreting that like we do. Well, duh. That's the whole problem we're having here. Huh? Uh, we're not the one who's trying to prove and because it's already been proven. It's no different than it is in court today. If you want to convict somebody, you've got you to bring evidence they're guilty of the crime. Hello? In, in, isn't there a, a, a law, something about it that says uh, innocent until proven guilty? Presumption. Yeah. So anyway, when Muhammad was alive, he claimed to receive the revelation of these two, of this book. Uh, this means at that time, the Bible was in existence. It could not have been corrupted because the Quran states that God's word cannot be corrupted. Isn't that interesting right there when you think about it? Throw that lovingly toward your Muslim convert that you're trying to reach. Uh, the question that we have for Muslims is, when and where was the Bible corrupted? Since the Quran says that the Torah, the Psalms, the Gospel are all uh, from Allah and Allah's words can't be changed. You know, you, we got, sometimes you have to put people in a position to where they have to come back and say, oh, okay, let me study that. Let me go research that. That's what you want a Muslim to do. Muslim is not the type of person typically uh, that's going to get saved the first time you witness to them. I mean, you've got to be in a Muslim nation where they have heard nothing about Jesus Christ when you get a chance to preach to crowds and you'll see hundreds get saved. I have had literally hundreds if not thousands answer altar calls preaching in crusades in India, in the Muslim areas of India. India is strongly, mostly Hindu, but it has a strong Muslim population. You get up there and you preach, and the first time, I mean, you just be simple with them. You tell them about Jesus. You tell them about stuff that they're supposed to not believe in, and they just sit there like birds with their eyes wide open. You give an altar call, and, man, they just pour themselves out toward Jesus. And here's the faith they're operating on. They know they're going to be rejected by their Indian family, and they're going to be rejected by their Muslim faith. They're going to be cut off and left totally out in the cold. Nowhere to live, no income or anything if they go to that altar. And they will overwhelm you by flooding you to come to Christ. They are ready to, to live in the streets. They are ready to take the lowest positions. They are ready to be persecuted to believe on this man Jesus because Jesus gives them hope. He promises them life. He promises them forgiveness of sin and eternity. And Mohammed don't promise them jack in a box. Nothing. You know what I'm saying? Nothing. Jihad. We're interested in jihad in this country and in this nation because jihad has visited our shores and continues to knock, wanting to get in and to operate here. The, the idea about uh, jihad, it, it's holy war is what it is, or, or it means holy struggle. Uh, to most of us, we in immediately think about 911 or something like that. But the term jihad means to struggle in Arabic. It often brings up images of Muslim terrorists killing people who disagree with them. But jihad is an emotionally charged word that has her is heralded by the Western news media descriptions of the Middle East activities. But we uh, need to really understand the concept and the idea to a Muslim. The idea is spiritual struggle along with physical struggle. In other words, first of all, a Muslim is called to do warfare uh, on behalf of Islam, on behalf of their personal faith. Like we are called to bear our cross, to crucify the flesh. Well, uh, in Islam, they kind of term that as jihad. But it also includes uh, joining your, uh, you joining your people, your Muslim nation in physical battle and resistance 
to any uh, opposing force or armies, which if you look at it from their perspective, we in America are the great Satan. We are the opposing spiritual force, and therefore we as natural human citizens who propagate this demonic thing that we call Christianity, uh, you become an opposing enemy or force. And so being the fact that Islam is a mandate to world domination, they feel it is, uh, they feel it is essential for them to do what they can to see Islam take preeminence in our lives and in our government. That's where they stand on these issues. So they struggle inwardly about it, personally, and they struggle inwardly about the fact that Sharia law and Islam is not the leading force in this nation, but they also struggle in the natural. Uh, and that is, they feel that it is, uh, it is commanded of Allah to naturally impose this force. Uh, they moved throughout North Africa, throughout the Middle of East, throughout history. They came over into Spain, as we said, up into Europe before they were driven back. And they still today are still making those efforts. And they're doing quite well to take ground and win commerce. Jihad has been interpreted by Muslims in different ways. The Muslim sect of the uh, Karachites has elevated jihad to one of the five pillars. So for some Muslims now... There are six pillars now, and jihad is the sixth. Uh, this kind of belief is seen in the extremist Muslim groups called terrorists. They use the concept of jihad as a justification for killing anybody who's not a Muslim. Uh, uh, most Muslims disagree with this extremist position of some Muslims and advocate peace. These Muslims view jihad as a spiritual struggle against evil in a metaphorical sense. So I'm just re-saying what I just said. For the most part, the greater and lesser jihad. The greater jihad is the internal spiritual struggle of the Muslim towards submission to Allah. The lesser jihad is holy war against non-Muslims. All right? So we are seeing uh, more of the lesser in these days begin to come into existence. Um, let's see. Islamic scholar Jamal Badawi Chairman of the Islamic Information Foundation in Halifax insists that a jihad is permitted only in self-defense or against tyranny and oppression, not as a tool to promote Islam. Uh, that's his opinion. But the deeds and the actions of others show us something else. Experts have added that the ancient Islamic empires were built as much by force as by permission. Muhammad frequently used force or the threat of it to unify the nomadic tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. The caliphs who succeeded him as leaders of the Arab world successfully took up arms against the Christian Byzantine Empire in Egypt and the Holy Land. By the end of the ninth century, Arabian armies had extended Islamic power from Spain to the borders of India. Anyone who studied Islamic history... Uh, has noticed how frequently the Muslims were involved in battle after battle. This uh, chronology that I gave you, the dateline of Muhammad, his life, and Islam, if, when you look at that, you will see that the last many years, upon, one upon the other, all they did was fight everybody they could find. That's, that's all they were about, is taking dominion, conquering, you know, and through force, brute force, just like...